Good evening and welcome to Lyra Lee Online. Hope y'all are having a, a great day. Uh, hope y'all enjoyed uh, service this morning. If you haven't, uh, if you weren't here this morning and didn't catch it online, uh, go to our Facebook page. It's going to be live on the Facebook or it's on the Facebook page. Uh, if you're friends with me, I shared it this morning uh, as well. But again, hope you're having a great day. If you have any prayer requests or concerns, uh, drop those in the comments. Uh, if you're watching this from the website, you can scroll down to the, the, the bottom there and there's the prayer thing that you can fill it in. Uh, if you're on YouTube or watching this on Facebook, obviously you can put it in the comments. Uh, but anyhow, uh, the announcements are pretty much the same. Uh, we've got kids and youth on Wednesday night at uh, starting at 7 o'clock. Now, if they want to eat, they can come here a little bit early and get a chance to eat. Um, but if all they want to do is come for the lesson, show up at 7. And we're going to ask parents to make sure they're not dropping their kids off uh, prior to uh, 7 o'clock and I got to fix this real quick. Bear, bear with me because this is starting to do a thing again that I've got to fix. And so I'm going to go mute for just a second. Check, 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 check. Check, 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 check. Okay, I think that fixed it. Yeah, we're the timing is back right. Uh, this thing's been being weird tonight. This is like the fourth time I've had to stop recording and start back over because my microphone uh, or my audio is doing something weird. And I don't know if it's my headsets or if it's my microphone. It's always something. It's always something. I'm so glad. I'll be so glad when we're like 100% back uh, in the building and um, not having to do online stuff. I've enjoyed the online stuff. Um, and I'm probably... Whenever we are 100% back in the building and I may do something like this, use this setup to do like a, uh, you know, 5, 10, 15 minute uh, podcast kind of type thing. Maybe we'll see. We'll see what my time, what time looks like uh, to maybe do it on a Tuesday or a Thursday or something like that. And it'll probably be um, uh, apologetics based or uh you know, uh, something, an idea I've been kind of tossing around is kind of scrolling with, uh, you know, as I'm going through and I'm scrolling on my social media and I see something that jumps out at me to kind of address it and, and something and, and address it from a biblical world worldview. I've, I've kind of been tossing that idea around a little bit and it won't be anything dealing with politics or stuff like that, but it's just, it's just stuff that you see while you're scrolling and uh, worldly things that you see as you're scrolling and kind of addressing it from a, a biblical worldview. Um, it's kind of what I, but anyhow, I'll be glad when I'm not doing like Sunday night and Wednesday night lessons like this. Uh, but speaking of a Sunday night and Wednesday night lesson, let's jump right into it. We are, uh, in the book of Acts, uh, the Acts of the Apostles. Um, and this week we are going to be in chapter 18. So chapter 18 of the Acts of the Apostles and to give you an idea of what's been going on, Okay, these are absolutely driving me bonkers, and I'm just gonna trust. I'm, I'm just gonna. I'm gonna just gonna have to trust that um, I'm not getting any feedback or anything. I'm gonna try to watch my my histogram there on the bottom uh, because for some reason my headphones are constantly getting backed up. Anyhow, the the audio is coming back slower and slower through my headphones. Uh, which is so weird. Uh, it's been driving me crazy. Like all I've, this is like I said, like the fifth time I've tried to record this because uh, it's been doing that. Anyhow, uh, we've been in uh, the Acts of the Apostle, and basically what's been going on thus far is uh, last week we talked about Paul in Athens, and Paul goes to Athens and he delivers what I consider one of his best sermons. Uh, just an awesome sermon, and he he takes the 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 unknown god that these Athenians are are worshiping, and he uh, 
uses that as a, as, as a, as a springboard to talk about Jesus. And they're kind of listening. They're kind of on board with what he's saying. Then he brings up the resurrection. He brings up some supernatural stuff. And at that point, they're like, yeah, we don't want to hear it. And so we, we leave off last week with Paul, who has delivered what I consider one of like the best sermons ever, and crickets. One or two people maybe get saved, uh, but for as good of a sermon as that the thing is, it really doesn't get the response that you would think that it, it should get. And so Paul leaves Athens. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, Paul in Corinth. So uh, Acts 18, chapter, uh, Acts 18, 1, it says, And after these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. So after uh, being in Athens, after um, after you know what we know happens in in Athens, uh, he goes right over, uh, pretty much next city over to the city of Corinth, and we'll show you kind of where that's at. Um, okay, maybe. Uh, so we have Athens here, and he goes over to Corinth, which is right here. Now, uh, Corinth, Corinth is is uh, pretty important uh, as. Something that uh, at, at this point uh, in uh, Greek, you know, uh, before um, the the Greece, uh, you know, the, the main city of Greece is is Athens, and it's it's the greatest city in Greece, and it's the intellectual capital capital. Uh, you know, this was a couple hundred years before uh, Jesus. They you know that Athens was the city in in Greece. Uh, however, now it's Corinth. Corinth is the the main city in in uh, Macedo- what would be considered Macedonia, Greece. Uh, it's it's like the the biggest city, and the reason being is because when you're sailing all in here, uh, you have you and you you're trying to get from the Aegean Sea over to to this side uh, in in the Mediterranean Sea. You have two options. Um, you can sail all the way around down this way or you can come right here to Corinth and they actually had made a land bridge to take ships over land uh, to put it back into this part of the sea and to go right on out and so Corinth becomes a a big um, trading area, it, it, cause like I said, you can cut a couple days out of your journey, uh, by taking this land bridge over Corinth. Now, uh, Nero, uh, Emperor Nero, when, whenever he was the emperor, he actually puts in a canal there at Corinth. They take away the land bridge and, and put in a canal so they could sail right through it. But at this time, uh, during Paul's life, uh, like I said, they would actually get the ships up out of the, um, up out of the the water and take them across on land, which is pretty cool. Uh, pretty cool stuff they did uh, back in the day. Um, so what this does for the city of Corinth is it makes it a trading hub. It makes it a you know business, uh, you know traders and sailors and merchants and all that came to Corinth, and it was really important for that reason. And so it ends up being the the biggest city in uh, Macedonia. It ends up being the trading capital of Macedonia. And so a- along with all of those things, along with the the trading capital, along with, um, you know, the merchants and, you know, travelers and and what have you comes debauchery. Uh, and so a lot of debauchery going on, a lot of, of, of kind of evilness going on in Corinth. And so this is where where Paul is. He leaves Athens and he goes to Corinth. And again, this is where uh, the Corinthian church is. Uh, so this is also, as, as we are, are studying this, uh, keep in mind that not only are we... This has other implications than just the book of Acts. It's also First and Second Corinthians. This is the church that this was written to. Um, anyhow, so let's continue on. Let me get, oh, my mouse is over here. Uh, it's one of those days. It's being one of those afternoons. Acts 18.2. Uh, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila uh, who had recently come from, uh, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, 
because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So, uh, Paul, this is, uh, of course, uh, Aquila and Priscilla, uh, two famous people who are pretty famous. Um, you know, we hear a lot about them. Quite, you know, not a lot, uh, but famous B characters of the Bible. Uh, and these guys end up being great friends with Paul. Um, there are some actual indications in the book of Corinthians that when Paul showed up in, uh, when Paul shows up in Corinth, he's kind of kind of not in the, the greatest headspace when he shows up in Corinth. Uh, there's, you know, if we, we read into the book of Corinthians, it says, Hey, when, when I got to you, um, you know, Paul starts describing his mental state and that he, it was, it's kind of bad. He was kind of down. It seems like, and you can see why, I mean, he's had a, this, the first missionary journey, uh, was by and large a, a big success. And this one has the second missionary journey has, he's hit a, a lot more potholes. He's hit a lot more bumps in the road in this second one. And he just leaves, uh, you know, he's there by himself. Uh, he's tra- like at this point he is traveling by himself and he just left from Athens where he just, he kind of struck out. He didn't strike out. He just, it was a strikeout. Um, he did awesome. Yeah, uh, the, the sermon that he delivers in Athens is, is an awesome sermon, but it just, it falls on hardened hearts. And, and so there's some indica- indications in, in the, his letters to the Corinthians that when he showed up in Corinth, he was, he was pretty down. He, he was, he was pretty discouraged. He was pretty down and he meets, uh, Priscilla and Aquila and just the right time. And so let's see what all else happens with Priscilla and Aquila. It says, so because, uh, he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for, uh, they were by occupation tent makers. So he, he meets Aquila and Priscilla, and they are, by occupation, uh, tent makers. And uh, so this goes back and he goes, well, well what was, uh, you know, what, what was Paul? Was he, uh, was he a Pharisee? Was he a Christian? Was he a tent maker? Uh, all of the above. Uh, was, he a, was he a rabbi? Uh, all of the above. You know, a lot of times Pharisees were rabbis and rabbis were Pharisees and Regardless to to what you were, you had a trade. You even if you were a a a rabbi, a teacher, you still had a trade. Jesus was a rabbi, but he had a trade. He was a carpenter, and so Paul would have learned a trade. And typically, you learn your trade from your father. And Paul was a tent maker, and a tent maker is um is more than just a tent maker. We call him a tent maker, and that's what we, they were called in in uh, the the biblical, you know. In, in, in that book of Acts, but they were also tent makers, leather workers. Um, you know, they, 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 they had a, a lot of different things you know, maybe, you know, they dealt with in, in some garments kind of stuff. Uh, but largely they worked with leather, uh, because the tents were made out of leather. And so, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, the same occupation and, and Paul, uh, of the same occupation as a tent maker. And so, he works for him, and, and he, uh, at this point in his ministry, Paul actually becomes bivocational, which I, I take some, uh, uh, I, I take, I take some, um, um, comfort in knowing that even, uh, you know, Paul the Apostle, bivocational, that's awesome. Uh, but anyhow, let's continue on. Let's get to the, the meat of what's going on here. Uh, it says, and he reasoned in the synagogues every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and, uh, Gentiles, uh, both Jews and Greeks, excuse me. Uh, so while Paul is working, while Paul, so Paul is kind of in this thing when he's first in his mission, uh, in Corinth where he will, Go to the, uh, he's working during the week. He's working as a tent maker, working and, and, uh, just making a living. And then on Sabbath, he goes into the synagogues and he reasons and he teaches and he, uh, debates and, uh, eventually persuades both, uh, Jews and Greeks. And so Paul, 
even though he is not doing his typical kind of ministry where he is there, he's making a splash, he's uh, all he is there focused on doing is uh, ministry, he's kind of doing a bivocational thing, he is still doing ministry. He's still, uh, even though he's in a situation where, you know, if he's working, he's probably because they're about out of money and he's having to work, uh, he is still making sure he's doing ministry. He's never, he, he is never stopping doing ministry because of that. He is, he is still doing uh, ministry. 18.5, and when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, uh, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to both, uh, testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And so when uh, Timothy, when Silas and Timothy could meet up with him, uh, he shifts gears a little bit. Instead of just uh, persuading them and instead of just arguing with them, he is now he is full blown preaching. He is full blown preaching Jesus and teaching Jesus. And it, it is, you know, the, the, <laughs> you know, the, the warm up is over. The, the little bit of hints here, the little, the arguing, uh, you know, the, the debating is over now. Now we are full blown preaching Jesus and, um, you know, doing what Paul typically does, uh, whenever he comes into a city. Acts 18, 6, but when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to him, your blood be upon your own hands. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So Paul, uh, again, he is, he's been preaching to the Jews, teaching to the Jews, uh, and trying to convince the Jews. Uh, he has been debating with them. He has been giving them logical arguments. He has been doing all of these things. And when uh, Paul or, or when Silas and Timothy show up, he switches gears from kind of the debating and the intellectual arguments and uh, this to, to full-blown preaching Jesus. And when he does, they, they oppose him. And not only do they oppose him, they blaspheme Jesus and they blaspheme, uh, you, you know, they blaspheme the gospel. And in doing this, what he does is he shakes his, it says he shakes his garments uh, and says to him, your blood be on uh, your own heads. And, and the, the shaking of the garments is similar to, or, or, is, or is the same concept of what Jesus says of, of wiping off the dust uh, from your sandals. Whenever a Jewish person would travel to a Gentile country and return to the, the Holy Land, return to uh, Jerusalem, return return to Judea, what they would do is that they would wipe the dust of the Gentile nation off of their sandals and they would do their garments, you know, they would shake the dust out of their, the, the, the Gentile dust out of their garments before entering into uh, Judea. And it's just, it's it, basically, it's a sign of disrespect. It's basically, it's a sign of, I don't want anything to do with you. I don't want anything to do with the Gentile nation that I have been in because I don't even want to bring the dust from this Gentile nation back into the promised land, back into Judea. And, and it's, it's kind of a Jewish insult. It's kind of like, uh, a, I'm completely done with you, and that's what uh, that's what Paul is doing here, and he, and he says, "Listen, I've I've preached to you, I've taught you, I've told you the gospel, and you've rejected it, and it's on you now. You will never be able to stand before God on Judgment Day and say, yeah, Paul never told us because Paul told you.' And sometimes as Christians, we've got to learn this, and and again, this is something that. Uh, you know, last week, last week I brought, I brought this up in, in a sermon of that. Um, we have to, as tough as it is, we've, we, we've got to sometimes with some people that we have been, uh, preaching to some people that we have been teaching, uh, people that we have been ministering to. Sometimes we just have to leave them alone for a little while. I'm not saying don't pray for them, but sometimes we just have to come to a place where we go, you know, I, I've told you, I've shared with you, I've lived out the gospel in front of you. And if your heart's hard, your heart is just hard. And I'm going to go and find someone who will listen. Here Paul is saying, saying I've, I've preached to you, I've taught you, I have, I, I have shared this with you. 
you're rejecting it, you're blaspheming against Jesus. You know what? I'm just, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. I'm going to go. I'm we're, I'm going to preach to the Gentiles now. From now on, I'm going to preach to the Gentiles. And I think that sometimes as Christians, we've got to, whenever we share our faith with somebody and they don't want to hear it, we just have to kind of take no for an answer and move on to the next person who hopefully wants to hear about Jesus, who wants to hear it. And I think that if we could develop that mindset and develop that thought process of let's find those people who want to hear about this. Uh, I believe that we would be more efficient in sharing our faith and more efficient in in, in making disciples and converting people, uh, just as Paul did. Acts 18, 7, he says, And then he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, uh, one who worshipped God. <laughs> and house was next door to the synagogue so what paul does is says listen i'm not hanging out with you dudes in the synagogue anymore um you know my home base is where my ministry base is now going to be next door the house next door <laughs> uh so the house next door to the synagogue is where he now sets up home base and it's and it's a, a man named justice uh, a greek who uh one who worshiped god and, you know, a Christian that was a convert. And he sets up his base of ministry out of this guy's house next door to the synagogue. 18.8. Then Cyprus, the, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all of his household. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. So here, um, the, the leader, the, so, the, so this is kind of weird how this happens, is that once... Uh, once Paul's no longer in the synagogue and teaching in the synagogue, Paul has has, has moved his home base next door. Uh, the leader of the synagogue becomes a Christian. And not only does he become a Christian, his entire household becomes a Christian. And he, uh, and again, this, this uh, sends shockwaves through the Corinthian community. And whenever he does it, He's somebody very influential. He's an influential leader. He's a synagogue leader. Uh, whenever he does it, it causes many, uh, many other people, many other Corinthians, many other, they, I mean, you know, the leader of the synagogue accepts it. You know, he's the smartest guy we know about the, the Torah. You know, he's the most devout Jew that we know, and, and he believes it so the, the, there may be something to this, and because of him, several people came to say, came to Christ. But also because of because there was him and several other people coming to Christ. This also it got good attention, and then obviously it got some bad attention, as we're going to see. Uh, Acts eighteen nine. It says, "Now the Lord spoke to Paul uh, in a night vision, saying, Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent.'" And so here is, is, so in, in this chapter, we have see Paul getting, um, Paul getting encouragement from old friends, uh, from our, our new friends through Priscilla and Aquila, Paul getting his encouragement from old friends of Timothy and Silas, Paul getting encouragement of seeing some, see, uh, seeing some moving in, in his, um, Ministries, his ministries are, are, are doing well. And, and you know, he, he, a, a key person uh, gets saved and, and brings people with him. And then here in verse 9, we see God actually himself uh, encouraging Paul and, and giving Paul some encouragement uh, to, to keep on going. And uh, sometimes we just need encouragement. Sometimes leaders need encouragement. Sometimes uh, Christians need encouragement. And these are the places that we uh, can find this encouragement. Acts eighteen ten. He says, "For I am with you, and no one will attack you or hurt you. For I have, uh, for I have many people in this city." And and so, God is saying to Paul, says, "Listen, you know, keep up the fight here in Corinth. Uh, keep up the fight here in Corinth. Uh, this is an important place. It's an important city." Uh, I know that it's filled with debauchery. I know this has been a tough missionary journey, but there are there are many people in this city that that if they get the gospel, they they will, they will probably respond to the gospel. 
And and there are many people in this city that that are seeking after me. And there are many people that you, you know God is telling him you can have an. That there's going to be an awesome church here. Uh, the church of of Corinth, you know, the Corinth church is. <laughs> they're going to have their problems, and you're going to have to write them to you know <laughs> kind of upfront letters uh, about hey, can you need to get yourselves right? But they're going to be two very successful. You know, it's going to be a very successful church here. Uh, so, so keep keep up the fight. Keep up the good work. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, Acts eleven eight uh, eighteen eleven. It says, and he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So, um, Paul has an extended stay in Corinth. Uh, he stays here in Corinth for quite some time, for a year and a half. Uh, and teaching and preaching and establishing the Corinth church. And it's, and, and it's a super strategic place. It's a, you know, and, and Paul probably realizes also just the, the str- st- strategic um, worth of Corinth. Because uh, as, you know, like we said, I mean, the, the Corinth is really the, the gateway from Asia and Macedonia to, uh, you know, Rome and Italy and, you know, Spain and the, the, that whole side of the Mediterranean that's not in this uh, picture. I mean, Corinth is the gateway um, through this because everything that sails, uh, you know, uh, through all of here is going to pass through Corinth. They're going to take that land bridge. And so Corinth is is a huge um strategic location for the gospel and to set up a church. And so, uh, again, this is another reason why I believe God has him, um, you know, making sure that he stays here and, and establishes this. But let's see. Let's continue on. Let's see what happens. Uh, Acts eighteen twelve. It says, when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, that, that, you know, uh, Corinth, another word for another for the area around in and around Corinth. Uh, the Jews, with one accord, rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. So, the Jews that have been opposing Paul, you know, the same ones that Paul, you know, shakes his clothes off, then he sets up shop next door to the synagogue. Then the the ruler, you know, the the ruler of the synagogue uh, gets saved. Um, all of these things happen and. The Jews want him gone for obvious reasons. They want him gone, um, and they've argued with him. They've debated with him. They can't get anywhere that like that. They've tried to slow down uh, the the Christian movement. They can't do anything like that. So, kind of a, a last ditch effort. Let's bring Paul before uh, the the proconsul of this area and see if we can get him arrested. Um, so let's see how that works out. So Acts 18, 13, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God that is contrary to the law. Now, uh, now this is what's interesting about this charge. It says, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. These are Jews. And basically, What's going on is that it is illegal in Rome, in the Roman Empire, to worship any gods other than Roman gods. Those are the only gods, technically, by the letter of the law, that you can worship in the Roman Empire. However, it's not enforced. It's one of those laws that are on the books, but, um, you know, there's Jews everywhere. There's Jews all over the Roman Empire. So because there are so many Jews in the Roman Empire, uh, this is largely overlooked. This is, you know, no, nobody's enforcing this. No, nobody, uh, you know, if you go down to Savannah, Georgia, there's still a law on the book in Savannah, Georgia, that you cannot hitch a horse to the west side of Broad Street. You can't do it. So if you go ever go down to Savannah, don't hit your horses to the west side of Broad Street. 
Now on the east side of Broad Street, there are still hitching posts where you can hitch your horse, just not on the west side. Still on the books in Savannah. Obviously not in Forks because nobody's riding horses, uh, you know, down Broad Street in Savannah. Uh, but again, it was just one of those laws that were on the books, but it wasn't enforced. It particularly wasn't enforced for the Jews because the Roman Empire is, is already like struggling to, to keep the Jews kind of in check. I mean, the Jews were kind of the the problem child of the Roman Empire, and they were always having revolts, and they were always having riots, and, and they, they were wealthy, and, and they, they were relatively powerful uh, a people group in the Roman Empire. And so um, they let them worship. They let them worship the, the way they wanted to worship. So here, here are a group of Jews bringing what the Romans would, and I'm going to get into this uh, more in depth in just a minute, but what the Romans would consider just another Jew to them Try saying that, okay, we want you to arrest him for doing what you've always allowed us to get away with. <laughs> we want you to arrest him for, for breaking the same law that you look the other way when we do. So let's see how this works out for him. Uh, Acts 18, 14. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, uh, Galileo said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O oh Jews, there would be a reason why I should bear with you. So they bring Paul before the proconsul, and Paul is about to begin his defense Paul's about to start explaining what, you know, whatever defense he has. And this guy cuts him off. This guy doesn't even let him testify before he cuts him off and starts just, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not even going to hear this. Not even going to hear this. And so let's, let's, what else he says? Uh, he says, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O oh Jews, there would be a reason why I should bear with you. But this is a question of words and names and of your own law. Look to it yourself, for I do not want to be a judge of such. <laughs> I do not want to be a judge of such matters. Ouch. Ouch. Um, basically he says, uh, I'm not even going to hear this case. I'm not, I'm not even, I'm not, this, this case isn't even worth my time. Ouch. Now, this brings up a apologetical point as well, because opponents of the Bible, uh, will look at the first century AD and they will go, okay, if Christianity was blooming and Christianity was doing all of these, uh, all of this stuff, why is there no Roman reference in the first century to Christianity? And here in this passage, it gives us an answer to that. Um, here uh, in verse 8 and verse 15, it says, if but if it is a question of words and names and of your own law. So this pro this proconsul, this Roman, is not seeing this case that is coming up as a Jewish versus Christian case. He is seeing this as a Jewish versus Jewish case. And this passage makes it very clear that the position of Romans in the first century is they, they didn't recognize Christianity as a thing. Uh, as its own thing. They recognize Christianity as Judaism. And, and there's a lot in the first century in Roman um, literature about Judaism being a problem and Judaism striving in certain places and Judaism, um, you know, taking off and doing some different things and, and riots because of Judaism. And it's very possible that some of the stuff that is talked about the uprisings that are talking about because of Jews arguing amongst themselves very well could be Jews and Christians arguing, but Jewish leaders, I mean, uh, Roman leaders 
didn't make any distinction between Jews and Christians. They just looked at Christians as an offset of Judaism uh, in the first century. Uh, and there were, um, you know, guys like Josephus, who was actually a Jew, who was a Jewish historian for the Romans. He made clear distinctions between um, Jews and Romans or Jews and Christians. Uh, but Roman writings in themselves didn't. But this is why, because Romans just considered Christians Jews, a uh, sect of Jews, and, and we see that here. This is kind of his attitude, and his his attitude towards this whole thing is I'm I'm. This has nothing to do with me. This has he hasn't committed a crime. This is y'all arguing over your own theology, over a religion that technically none of you should be practicing, but we let it go. I let it fly for you. I'm going to let it fly for him. I'm not even here in this case. I'm throwing it out. Okay, so kind of an embarrassing verdict here for the Jews. Um, Acts 18, 16, and he drove them from the judgment seat. So he's pretty much like, y'all get out of here. Don't, don't, don't come here with this frivolous stuff. Acts 18, 17, then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, uh, the ruler of the synagogue. This is a new ruler of the synagogue because the old one became a Christian <laughs> and beat him before the judgment seat. Uh, but Galeo, the proconsul, took no notice of these things. So they, they take this guy and um, they, <laughs> they obviously are embarrassed. They're frustrated about uh, that they're frustrated that their case didn't go the way they wanted their case to go. And they take their uh, frustration out on the leader of the synagogue. Uh, now, uh, exactly why they do this, uh, there are two possibilities. One is this guy actually becomes a Christian. Uh, so he is either a Christian at the time that, that this particular leader, the new leader of the synagogue, he also becomes a Christian. We find that out in the book of Corinthians that he also becomes a Christian. Um, so either A, they find out that he actually has become a Christian and so they're beating him because of that, or B, they are beating him because he botched this trial against Paul, or maybe it was his idea to, to bring this trial against Paul and this idea. We, we don't really know why they're doing it. Um, either A, they found out that he had become a Christian, or B, they are taking their frustrations out on him uh, because they feel like he's the blame for the botched trial. And this might be the reason that he became a Christian uh, because his own folks beat him over something. Who knows? Uh, all we do know is that he did, in fact, become a Christian. We found that out in the book of uh, in in Corinthians that he is listed as one of the members of uh, the church of Corinth. Um, so um, pretty interesting stuff. Uh, Paul gets here in Corinth um, and, and this is the, the church in Corinth is um, the most strategic place in Macedonia um, because of its lo location, because of, uh, its influence because of its size. Um, Paul shows up here. He's by himself. Uh, we have some, some indications from the book of Corinthians that he is discouraged when he shows up and he finds encouragement. He, he shows up there and instead of going straight in and, and, uh, doing ministry like he typically does, he does some bivocational type stuff. He finds he makes some new friends and finds encouragement from that. He finds encouragement from old friends when they show up. And just through sticking it out and struggling through it and overcoming, uh, the church of Corinth is established. Uh, the Corinthian church is established and uh, ends up being one of the most important and influential churches Um in the first century, in the first, second century, uh, huge, inf very influential church, uh, very important church as far as spreading Christi Christianity, as far as um, making, you know, making Christianity what it becomes. Uh, and what we need to take away from this is 
there is no cookie cutter ministry. There is no, um, e- even whenever, you know, hey, we've, we've done it like this, this, and this, and this has worked. Doesn't mean it's always going to work that way. Doesn't mean that there aren't going to be times that we've got to back up and go back to tent making and kind of go back to some basics and rework our, our how we're doing things to to reach a person, to reach a city, to, to do a certain ministry. And we always need to be, as, as we are planning ministries, as we are um, planning, I hate to say programs because programs have such a negative connotation, but even planning programs, um, as we are doing things, as we are trying to reach people, uh, we, we don't need to approach that with, okay, well, um, this, this, and this is kind of, how it's worked before, uh, we can take those into consideration, of course. But the big thing, big way we need to approach it is what is God calling us to do right now? What is God calling us to do in this season, in this hour, uh, in this moment? What, what is God uh, calling us to do? How is God calling us to do this particular ministry? Um, that's what's important. So I, w- I want us to keep that in mind. Um, and again, we're, we're kind of halfway through it and, and this is like the stopping point where I kind of have to stop or I'm going to start digging into like next week's lesson and then next week's gonna, anyhow, this is going to be the stopping point and we're going to pick back up with the rest of chapter 18 next week. Uh, but I hope y'all are, I hope y'all have had a, a great week. Hope y'all continue to have a great week. If y'all need anything, uh, feel free to reach out and I'm going to close this up in prayer. Lord, we come before you God, and I just want to thank you so much for this time. Thank you so much for Paul. Thank you so much for his ministry, and God, I, I just thank you for Corinth. I, I believe that Corinth is such a instrumental place. Uh, God, I, I want to thank you that that you look after us. That whenever uh, there are times that that you allow us to go through the trials, and there are times that uh, the trials are over before they start. And God, I, I again, I want to thank you for the perseverance to get us through the trials when they go full force. And God, I want to thank you for the grace of whenever trials are over before they start. Uh, and God, right now, I just want to pray for all of our members. I want to pray for everybody who's watching. God, keep them safe from sickness. And God, I pray that you bring us back to uh, what whatever normalcy is going to be, whatever uh, you're, you want for us. And God, I pray that that as we are getting closer to to what may be normal, God, I pray that we're sensitive to your calling and sensitive to what you want from us and sensitive to um, the direction that you're going to be taking us. Lord, we love you. We give you all the honor, glory, and praise in Christ's name. Amen. Y'all have a great night, great week, great evening, and I will see y'all online on Wednesday. Bye, y'all.